Okay, so welcome to um, our first little roundup video. Um, hoping today that I can just talk you through some of the things that you um, should have been completing on your uh, first task. Um, the first section was all about the global patterns of energy. So thinking about which areas of the world have the most energy resources and which areas consume the most energy. Um, turning our attention to the map, um, hopefully you've managed to add on some um, suitable annotations. So firstly, you know, it mentions here that high income countries such as North America, um, you know, the same would apply for Europe, um, have very high levels of energy consumption. Um, but it's also worth noting uh, maybe a couple of other areas that have particularly high levels of energy consumption, um, places like Iceland um, and countries like Saudi Arabia as well. Um, the reason their energy consumption is very high, we can see here um, it's between 75,000 and 100,000 um, kilowatt hours. Um, the reason that it's so high in those countries is because they have access to a really, really abundant supply of resources. Um, so in Iceland's case, um, things like geothermal power and hydroelectricity, um, and in Saudi Arabia, um, obviously large reserves of oil as well. So countries with large energy reserves also tend to consume lots of energy. Um, energy consumption is also relatively high um, in newly emerging economies. So places like China, okay, um, places like Indonesia, Brazil, um, countries where large amounts of manufacturing takes place. Obviously, China um, is well known for being the kind of factory of the world. Um, so lots of our um, products are made there, shipped all over the world, and hence why um, that country has a particularly kind of high level of energy consumption as well. Turning our attention then to the other end of this scale, we can see that um, you know, down here, sort of in the region of a thousand kilowatt hours, that's a hundred times smaller um, than the top end of this graph. OK, now, while we haven't got data for lots of countries within Central Africa, there's various reasons for that. We can see that lots of countries that we know to be low income countries, they also have very low levels of energy consumption. That's because the level of development in those countries um, is is nowhere near um, the same kind of standard of living that we enjoy in high income countries or even is experienced in um, newly emerging economies like like India or China or Brazil that we mentioned earlier. So people on a day to day basis using very little energy in their daily lives and also um, very little industry um, that's also con consuming a lot of energy. So just to recap, kind of three or four main patterns, high income countries consuming a lot of energy, countries with large energy reserves like Iceland and Saudi Arabia, they're also consuming high amounts of energy. A significant amount being consumed in newly emerging economies, okay, particularly as a result of industrialization, and also very low levels of energy consumption um, in the least developed parts of the world, in our low income countries, because they simply um, are not consuming energy um, in their daily lives. OK, moving on to the second part, then um, you had to study the maps here, which showed energy reserves across the world. Um, it showed you information for three um, different natural resources. You had natural gas, oil and coal. Now we can see that um, for natural gas, that tends to be um, spread quite unevenly around the world. So Russia has significant reserves of natural gas. Um, as do parts of the Middle East, often where you find oil, you also find natural gas. Um, but other areas such as um, the USA also have particularly large um, reserves of gas. We can see the absence of it um, within Africa um, and also within parts of Europe as well, with the exception, obviously, of, of Russia that I mentioned earlier. Oil as well is even less evenly distributed. Um, so the vast majority of oil um, is in is in the Middle East. Um, Canada has a significant share, um, as does Venezuela here in South America. OK, but really those three regions account for almost all of the oil reserves. Very little in Asia, again, very little in Africa and almost no 
um, reserves to speak of um, in Europe. Coal, again, shares that similar pattern, doesn't it, of having um, very uneven distributions. So again, Russia um, has significant reserves. Um, Australia as well, and a lot of that um, coal from Australia is exported um, to other regions as well. The USA with significant amounts, um, and India and China as well. And, and this re um, these reserves of coal are something that have really um, help to fuel um, the industrial growth in China um, and in India. So turning our attention to this question then, what relationship do you notice between the distribution of reserves of fossil fuel energy resources? Well, I think there's two things that we can say. Um, one of those um, is that they are very unevenly distributed. That applies for all of those three um, energy sources for oil, for gas um, and for coal. Um, and it's also worth us noting that actually a small number of countries actually appear um, on more than one map. So Russia, when we look at coal um, and gas, um, the USA, when we look at coal um, and gas, Saudi Arabia, when we look at oil and gas. So some countries um, have particularly large energy reserves um, and that gives them um, a significant dis uh, advantage when it comes to um, maybe trading with other countries. So some countries um, have a significant um, store um, of energy sources. The main thing though is this idea about things being uneven. OK, so if we turn our attention then to um, the third question, uh, what relationships do you notice between energy consumption and the distribution of reserves of fossil fuel energy resources? Um, there's really kind of four things that we can pick out again. Um, so firstly, uh, this uneven pattern that the distribution of reserves doesn't match um, perfectly anyway. Uh, where energy is actually being consumed. Okay, so there are some countries um, where um, there are significant reserves of energy who also use lots of energy. So we mentioned places like that earlier, like Saudi Arabia, um, like the USA, they have significant um, energy reserves and therefore they tend to use lots of energy. The other issue though is that there are lots of countries with very high levels of energy consumption that don't have their own resources. Um, if we look back at the map from earlier, we try and almost compare um, these two side by side, we can see that some areas like Europe here, high levels of energy consumption, okay, um, don't actually on any of these maps um, with the exception of natural gas for the UK um, and a little bit of Eastern Europe, don't actually have very significant um, energy reserves. Um, so while we are consuming a lot of energy, we aren't necessarily um, able to do that using our own resources. Which leads us on to the final point um, that actually this therefore relies on a significant amount of trade between countries um, to make sure that um, each country can access um, the energy sources and resources that they need. OK, and on to the final um, section then, which is all about this idea of energy security. Um, now, we've covered the idea of security um, already when we thought of maybe food security or water security. Um, and really, the idea of energy security is no different. It's all about this balance between supply and demand. Okay, so um, if the um, demand for energy, the energy that people are consuming, if that demand is less than the supply, um, that supply could be either the resources that a country has um, or ones that they're able to import, then the level of energy security is going to be quite high. Um, if, on the other hand, um, the demand for energy, the energy that people are using, if that exceeds supply, then 
a country is likely to experience energy insecurity. So it all comes down to that idea between supply and demand. So um, if supply meets demand, um, or in some cases actually even exceeds it, then we would say that a country has energy security. Okay. If, on the other hand, um, the supply of energy does not meet demand, um, perhaps people in a country are using more energy than that country is able to produce, um, then that is where we end up um, with the problem of energy insecurity. Um, so really it's just a case of this balance between supply and demand. If it meets it, we have security. If it does not meet the demand for energy, then we have energy insecurity. The map below um, shows you the levels of energy security around the world. Um, so we can see that for some countries, um, we mentioned Australia having large coal reserves or Saudi Arabia having large oil reserves, Russia having large reserves of natural gas. You can see why they um, clearly are able to achieve um, very good levels of energy security. So we turn our attention to the key here, we can see that the countries in red have extreme risk, orange have high risk, medium risk in yellow and low risk in green. So actually, even countries like the UK, okay, most of Europe, okay, um, we have a high risk of energy um, insecurity. Um, and that's because, as we mentioned earlier, we don't have large reserves of things like coal and oil um, and natural gas. So we are reliant on other countries for imports. Um, and that means that our energy supplies are at risk. Other countries um, which have their own reserves of energy, like Australia, Saudi Arabia and Russia, they are not reliant on other countries and therefore um, that's why they have quite high levels of security, um, or in this case, a low risk of insecurity. We then had some facts at the bottom and some examples to give in there. Now you may have um, given some different um, examples, to maybe to the ones I'm about to come up with here. Okay, um, but the first one, high levels of energy insecurity um, are experienced by both HICs and LICs or NEEs. So again, we could give examples of um, the insecurities being faced by Europe, okay, um, or the USA, but also um, countries like Brazil as a newly emerging economy, okay, um, or places in Central Africa, so um, Chad or Ethiopia, um, or the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Um, these low-income countries here also um, suffer from um, those high levels of energy insecurity. Countries with the lowest levels of insecurity tend to be those rich in resources. Well, again, we've given some examples of that already. Places like Saudi Arabia, like Australia, um, like Russia and Canada as well. OK, so natural gas, coal um, and oil. The third fact, um, energy insecurity can be experienced by countries with both a high and low level of energy consumption. Um, again, we can link that back to maybe that difference between Europe and um, Africa. So um, in Europe, we have quite high levels of energy consumption, but also a high risk. In Africa, some of these countries I mentioned earlier, they have the lowest um, levels of energy consumption, yet they are also um, at high risk. So it's not just about the amount of energy um, that you are consuming. Um, and finally, even some countries with a high energy supply can experience energy insecurity where demand for energy um, is high. Um, maybe the best example to use for that one, if we were to go back and just have a look at our um, proven reserves, um, places like China. OK, so in terms of natural gas reserves, quite high levels of natural gas reserves, quite high levels of coal reserves, but actually when we look at that country um, in terms of um, energy security, they are actually at medium risk, okay? And quite understandably, 
that's mainly down to the size of the population which means that the demand for energy is is very high so even though they have lots of their own reserves to be able to supply it maybe not always able um, to meet that demand in the way they'd like so i hope that's been helpful to you um, i'll do another one of these videos next week um, to help give you some pointers about um, the bits uh, that you need to be completing in the next section of the booklet well done